Let's talk about constant volume. One thing that you saw already happen is that by selecting the pressure to remain constant, we made the heat turn into an independent uh, parameter, which did not depend on path whatsoever. Uh, and so keeping the volume constant can have another interesting effect that I want to point out. Uh, now, the way you keep the volume constant is by having your gases in a vessel that cannot expand, that is, you know, fully sealed. And usually we're talking about like stainless steel flasks, although if you're dealing with low pressures or low enough pressures, you could actually do it in borosilicate glassware. But you got to be careful because if you pressurize it just a tiny bit too much, the whole thing could actually burst out, you know, and explode. But anyway. A constant pressure, what happens is that the heat is given automatically by the number of moles times the heat capacity at constant volume times the change in temperature. The work, however, which depends on the change in temperature, automatically, if the volume is constant, the work is equal to zero. Right, so, yeah, and then once again, the changing heat per mole is given by the constant, the heat capacity at constant volume times the change in temperature. The work is going to equal zero because the volume will not be changing. And then automatically, the internal energy will simply equal the change in heat, which itself equals the heat capacity constant volume times the change in temperature. And this particular feature is something I want to exploit to derive the next thermodynamic parameter known as entropy. The fact that the internal energy is given by the heat capacity constant volume times the change in temperature. All right, so I'm going to use that particular feature to now introduce entropy, which is the second thermodynamic parameter. And this is the first time that you get to see it. So um, it's kind of a treat the first time you, you get to see where this comes from. Ultimately, it has some serious consequences for thermodynamics, which will allow us to see two additional laws of thermodynamics that we haven't yet talked about. All right, so what we're going to do is um, keep in mind that the pressure, if you're dealing with an ideal gas, the pressure can be related based on the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT, or in other words, uh, P equals nRT over V, right? And not only that, if you base everything in per moles, right? So internal energy per mole, heat per mole, then you could also do the same thing with volume. This is the volume per mole, also known as the molar volume. And I differentiate molar volume from regular volume by writing V with a bar on top of it. All right, so what I'm going to do now is substitute not only the term for the pressure in the first law of thermodynamics, I'm also substituting the term for the internal energy in terms of the heat capacity at constant volume. So we have a uh, you know, number of substitutions going on right here. All right, now, um, if you add PdV to both sides, you're going to end up with the change in heat being equal to the heat capacity constant volume times the change in temperature plus RT divided by uh, the molar volume uh, times the change in the molar volume. Now, there's one specific feature in calculus and for that matter, differential equations that makes this type of systems a little bit difficult to deal with. Because technically speaking, if you look at this, the fact that you have dt and dv in these equations implies that the temperature and the molar volume are variables. And what makes this a little bit tricky is the fact that the second term right here has temperature and molar volume within the same function. So you're dealing with a uh, multivariable function, which complicates the picture a little bit. So in order to fix that problem and keep the temperatures just with the DTs for the most part and the molar volumes with just the changes in molar volume, what we end up doing is dividing everything by temperature. And so now we have a change in heat divided by temperature being equal to heat capacity constant volume over temperature times the change in temperature plus R over molar volume times the change in molar volume. And what you can see now is that we have functions that contain the DT or DV um, terms in association with only the corresponding regular function, right? Molar volume or temperature. This is something known as separation of variables. And it allows the function to become a state function as well. Because remember, 
at constant volume, the heat is not expected to be um, a state function. It's not expected to be path independent. That only happens if the pressure is constant. So right now, the changing heat is not path independent. But by dividing it by temperature, what we have created is something rather unique. Because uh, what this Maxwell relationship tells us is that if we take the derivative with respect to the first function and we follow it with the second function, that at a equal, the same function derived by uh, taking the derivative of the second variable followed by the first variable. And regardless of what type of derivatives you select in terms of the order, they should equal the same if they are to be path independent. Um, so what that means is that if you think of the CV over T as uh, the first function, function f, and if you think about r over v's uh, bar as function g, then technically speaking, what you do is just see what happens when you take the derivatives with respect to the first variable. So for f, take the derivative with respect to temperature, what you end up getting is something uh, a little bit different. It's going to look a little funky, but we also apply the same thing to g. We derive or take the derivative of that function with respect to dv and for the first one we're going to get negative uh, cv over t squared now if you're unsure as to how that happens this is all directly coming from calculus something that i don't expect you to know or be able to derive necessarily but i kind of want to show you to some degree how these things are kind of like playing out and you know how the the whole theme of the series you know gets to be observed so in the case of um G, we have a similar uh, picture because we're dividing by T or we're dividing by V uh, bar, taking the derivative with respect to that variable ends up yielding negative, you know, CV over T square or negative R over V bar square. And then if you take the derivative with respect to the second variable, well, the function that you have here doesn't have that variable there. So one thing that happens when you take the derivative of something that doesn't even have the variable you're using for your derivative, the whole thing becomes zero. And the same thing here, if you take the derivative with respect to temperature, nothing in here has temperature in it, so the whole thing ends up being zero. And so what you see is that whether you take the derivative of the first function and you, you know, change the variables or you do the same thing for the other one, you end up with the same results. In this case, they both equal zero. And because the result is the same for both approaches, the function dq over t is actually path independent. Like I said before, I don't expect you to fully understand what happened here in terms of taking the derivatives. You will have to have prior knowledge of calculus to fully understand what I just did. But the point is that based on the definition, the Maxwell equation definition, um, we are guaranteed that dq over t is actually a state function, a path independent function, to the point where we don't even bother calling it dq over t we actually give it its own name and the name that we give dq over t is entropy all right so the changing heat over temperature is what we regard to as the changing entropy a change of entropy as you can see is cv over t dt plus r over v bar dv if you want to be technical about what the function ultimately represents but as you're about to see i'm going to redefine it a little bit to kind of uh, fall more in line with the things we've seen for enthalpy. All right, so let's define entropy. This is a little bit funky because in most textbooks, what you're going to find out as far as the definition is that entropy is uh, a measure of randomness. And not to say that that definition is wrong, but it's rather vague and it doesn't really explain what the heck entropy actually is. It is true that you could look at what entropy is measuring as being um, the amount of chaos uh, of a system or the amount of randomness that a system can possess. But a better way to think about it, and specifically because entropy has units of energy, is that entropy is actually more a measure of how many ways a molecule or a system can accommodate and distribute the energy that it has available for it. And the idea is that the more ways in which a molecule can distribute its energy, the more stable it's gonna be. It's gonna have a lesser potential energy per state. And that's in essence what the entropy is looking and measuring. 
this distribution of energy. So to give you a proper example from the point of view of chemistry, you could have a, a molecule like chloromethane. One way in which it can actually um, distribute the energy available to it, like let's say room temperature, is to use the energy to move the molecule from one point to another, right? So you could translate the molecule from point A to point B. Or you could actually rotate the molecule. So you could actually have, uh, in respect to the carbon chlorine bond, you could be rotating that molecule. In fact, you could also do the same thing in respect to each carbon hydrogen bond, but you could rotate that molecule and use energy to undergo that rotation event. Right, and so you could rotate it, you could rotate it upon different axes, not in respect to bond, but you could actually do it in respect to any axis in the molecule. So the entire molecule could be rotated as well. You could also use energy. Now, this energy right here will have to be most likely than not infrared energy, whereas rotation is usually microwave energy. Um, but with infrared energy, which is usually thermal energy anyway, uh, you can stretch and bend bonds. So that's another way in which molecules can distribute the energy, right? And so you can stretch the bonds every which way. And the other way, if you have energy of uh, high enough value, like visible or ultraviolet, is to have electrons uh, get excited from one lower energy state to a higher energy state and create uh, excited species that, you know, after a while, you know, they relax back to this original state. But pretty much, the molecule via translation, rotation, vibration, or stretching, and via electronic excitation, it can accommodate the energy allocated to itself in many different ways. And by doing so, it distributes, distributes the energy in a much more random, chaotic manner, if you will. But it's basically accommodating that energy. So instead of like putting the full pot of money that this molecule has in one spot, it basically spreads it out into different places. Another way to look at it, which maybe is a little bit more practical, is to think of maybe a retirement accounts. Generally speaking, what people tell you to do with those accounts is to have your money not in one specific um, uh, company or, or uh, a fund, but to rather spread out your money into many, many different accounts. So in case one of them goes down, the other ones may compensate for that loss. So you might break up you know, break out even at the end, or maybe over time, you know, end up in a good situation. And in a way, that's kind of what's going on here. The energy is not allocated to one single event for the molecule. The molecule tries to spread out that energy into as many different facets as it can to make itself more stable. All right, so with all those explanations, we're gonna now start looking into how we apply the rules and the techniques that we have used for enthalpy to calculate the values of entropy. And after that, we'll look into what entropy ultimately, you know, ends up saying in terms of uh, its value. Okay, so I'll see you in the next video.